I'll switch to Design View to see how I managed to set up the links between the tables. So I'll go up here and click on the Design View icon. The first field name you see is Item ID, and you'll notice that its data type is listed as Auto Number and that it's the table's primary key field. We haven't had any auto number fields in my previous tables. Why here? You may remember that the primary key field must never contain duplicate records. What would happen in the bibliographic record table if you were creating a new item record and had two publishers with the exact same name to choose from? You'd have a 50-50 chance of attaching the wrong publishing firm to the record. Not a good idea. So why go to the trouble of adding an auto number field to this particular table? Why can't the title field be the primary key field instead? Would you ever expect to have duplicate titles in the catalog? Well, yes, possibly. A book title might be released as a second edition, a third edition, and so on. Same title, but most likely students are going to want to have access to the most recent version. So because of the possibility of title duplication, I'll play it safe and add an auto number field to the table. The first record I enter will be assigned a 1, the second record I enter will be assigned a 2, and so on. These numbers again are meaningless except that each one identifies a unique record in the catalog and that number stays wedded to the record forever. If, for example, I delete record 17, which has just been withdrawn from the collection, the number 17 in the auto number column is retired with the item. No other item in that table can be assigned a 17. A database depends upon consistency of data entry, and to reassign a number would have a dangerous ripple effect throughout the database. I'll go back to Datasheet View just for a moment. Do you notice the break in the number sequence between entries 18 and 23? Each time I use this database in teaching a class, I enter, and at the end of the class, remove a fictitious item record. Once the item record is deleted, so is its associated auto number. This accounts for the missing numbers in the sequence. I'll switch back now to Design View. Notice by the Author field there is a note in the Description field. Anything typed here is solely for the purpose of explaining what should be entered in the field. This text does not appear in the table itself. Let's look next at the data type for the Date Ordered field. The first setting down below in Field Properties is Format. Clicking once in the Format field reveals a down arrow. I'll click on the down arrow and see the various options for displaying dates in my table. I've chosen short date, so that's how all dates will appear in the table, regardless of how they were entered. I'll click on the arrow again to close that. Below you'll see that an input mask was applied. I'll click here and then click on the Build button. I'm prompted to save the table, so I'll click Yes to do that. The Input Mask menu shows you the various ways that dates can be entered. Short date has been chosen, then I'll click Next, and I'm asked if I would like to change the format in any way. I'll leave it as it is and click Next, and then I'll click Finish. Remember that the input mask controls how data is entered. Format settings dictate how data will display in the table. The Lookup Wizard is one of the data type options in Microsoft Access and is the one you'll choose when you want to link two tables. Notice the data type next to Publisher. It says text, which does reflect the kind of data I've entered. However, I did not originally select text. I selected the lookup wizard. If I try to click on that option to show its dialog box, 
I'll get an error message. Once you've completed the lookup wizard and have established a relationship between tables, it becomes difficult to re-enter the wizard and you will see an error message. But it is the lookup wizard that takes you through the steps of joining two tables. Once the linking is complete, Access chooses to display text as the data type, so it's not obvious just by looking at Design View which tables have used the wizard. In fact, the Media Format and Item Location Status tables use the wizard as well, and they're listed as text data types. When this tutorial shows you how to construct a small database from scratch, you'll have the opportunity to see how the lookup wizard actually works. The error that Access displays when attempting to get to the lookup wizard mentions that you cannot change the data type for this field because it is part of a relationship. We can see a visual illustration of this relationship in Access. I'll click OK and then I'll close out of this table. I'm prompted to save, so I'll say yes. I'll click on the Database Tools tab and then select Relationships. The field lists from the tables in my database appear side by side in the Relationships window. If during the creation of any tables you use the Lookup Wizard to create a lookup column in a data type field in Design View, then you'll see a join line that connects the tables. Access has, in this case, already set up a relationship between the two tables. You'll see here that the bibliographic record table has join lines connecting it to each of the three source tables. I can stretch these lists to reveal field names that are currently obscured. To stretch, I'll click on the bottom border and drag it down to expose the remaining fields in the bibliographic record and in the Publisher table. I can also stretch to make these wider. Notice how the primary key is displayed in each list. You'll see that the Publisher field in the Publisher table is the primary key, whereas in the Bibliographic Record table, the same field acts as the foreign key. In order to maintain the consistency of the link between tables, you will likely want to establish what is called referential integrity. This ensures that a record cannot be added to the foreign key field unless the record already exists in the primary key field. This is done in the Relationships window. I'm going to position the tip of my mouse pointer on one of the join lines and double click to bring up an Edit Relationships dialog box. Do you see the publisher table listed side by side under the Table Query and Related Table Query headings? Beneath them is a box that permits you to enforce referential integrity. Referential integrity ensures that if, for instance, a new publisher comes into play in this table, I must enter this new publisher first in the source table, the publisher table, rather than into the bibliographic table. If I have a new media type that comes into play, I cannot enter that into the bibliographic record table. I first must enter it into the media format table, and then I can pull it into the bibliographic record table. When you have referential integrity selected, you may also choose to enforce the rules by which any changes made to records in the primary key will also be automatically changed in the link table. This rule is known as Cascade Update Related Fields. So if I change the name of my publisher from Williams and Wilkins to Lippincott Williams and Wilkins because of a merger, that means that that publisher name change will cascade throughout all the other tables in the database. Another rule, 
cascade delete related records guarantees that any deletions made to entries in the primary key field will also ripple throughout the database. This, however, is not usually a good idea. If Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins were to go out of business, for instance, I would want to delete it from the publisher table, but I have many items in my library catalog that were published by Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins, and if I enforced Cascade Delete related records, all those items would vanish from my online catalog. So be careful. You normally will not want to select Cascade Delete related records. I'll go ahead and click OK. Notice the number 1 that appears on one end of the join lines and the infinity symbol that appears at the other end in the relationships window. These symbols designate the links between tables as a one-to-many relationship. What does this mean? Well, a book title in an online catalog can only come from one publisher, which is why you see the one next to the publisher table, for instance. However, any one publisher may supply many book titles to the library, and that's why you'll see the infinity symbol next to the bibliographic record table. Similarly, each record in the bibliographic record table can only be of one kind of media format, be it book or DVD, and that's why you'll see the number one next to the media format table. However, there can be many DVDs in the collection and many books, which is why you'll see the infinity symbol next to the bibliographic record. You'll see that I have enforced referential integrity and selected cascade update related fields in my other relationships as well. Enforcing referential integrity is not a default when you set up a relationship using the lookup wizard. So once relationships have been established, you'll need to go into the relationships window and manually select these options. I'll go ahead and close out the relationships window. Because I've made adjustments to the length and width of field lists, I am prompted to save the changes. I'll go ahead and click Yes. Let's examine how to create queries in Access. Queries allow you to combine data from multiple tables and or other queries into a new data sheet. Queries also allow you to extract data from an individual table or query. Access allows for a number of different types of queries, but I'm going to focus in this tutorial on the most common type, Select Queries. I'll create a query now and then I'll refine the query. I'll click on the Create tab and you'll notice in the Queries group there are two methods for creating a query. Query Wizard and Query Design. Because the design method offers greater versatility in constructing a query, I'll choose it here. And I personally favor it across the board. The Show Table window appears. I'm going to click here to move it up into the empty space. You can choose among tables, queries, or both depending upon what you're basing your query on. In my case, I'm selecting tables. A list of tables appears, and I can double click on each table from which I'd like to build my query. I'll double click this time on the bibliographic record table listing. A field list for this table appears in the upper section of the query window. I'm done, so I'll press close. Next, I'll stretch out the field list so that all the fields appear. So I'll click on the border, hold the mouse down, and drag. I'm now going to create a query in which I'll ask how many of Himmelfarb's heart sound titles are in the outdated audio cassette format. So for this, I would need to include the title and author fields as well as the media format field. To add them to my query, I simply go to the field listing and double-click on each. 
and they appear below. To set my criteria as selecting only things that match the media format type audio cassette, I'll go into the criteria row and enter in that term and press enter. You'll notice that the word I just typed appears inside of quotation marks. These quotation marks simply indicate that the word I typed within them is what will be searched on. Now when would you type anything that you wouldn't want access to search on? Well, how about Boolean operators? These include terms like and, or, not, greater than, less than, among others. Let's say, for instance, that I wanted to query titles that were in either audio cassette format or DVD format. What I would do is type it that way, audio cassette or DVD. Now let me stretch this column so you can see everything I've typed. Notice that the word or is not in quotes. So that word will not be searched on. Access assumed by default, the, the word or was a Boolean operator. If you wanted to include a word such as or that's commonly used as a Boolean operator as part of the phrase being searched on, you would need to put quotation marks around the whole phrase. I'm going to delete or DVD since I'm not querying on that. And please note, when entering your criteria, enter it correctly or Access will not recognize it. For instance, if I were to type audio cassette as two words, when I went to run the query, I would get no results. Now that I've entered the criterion, I'll run the query by clicking on the Run button, represented by the red exclamation point. This query has yielded four results. I'm going to save the query now, and I'll save it as audio cassette query. When I look again at my query results, I notice that the media format column, which displays the word audio cassette by each title, is redundant. We know by the title that this query is displaying audio cassettes. So is there a way to hide the column from this table? Yes, there is. I'm going to go back and click on Design View. And I'm going to tell Access to suppress the display of the media format column from the query results table. While this column is essential to my query, if I don't want it to display, I simply deselect the box that is currently checked in the show row. I'll run the query once more, and now the results appear as I want them to, without that extra column. Again, I'll press save, and I'll exit the query. I'll run one more query concerning Heart Sounds titles in the collection. I'll ask this time how many Heart Sounds titles currently on the library shelves were published prior to the year 2000. The library director is asking me to update the audiovisual collection, so I need to weed out titles prior to that year. Again, I'm going to make sure the Create tab is selected, and then Again, I'm going to choose Query Design. I want to base the query on fields in the bibliographic record table, so I'll double click on that listing. Then I'll press Close in the Show Table window. I'll stretch out the field listing by dragging the bottom border down until I can see all the fields displayed. I'm going to double click on the following fields to include them in the query. Title, Author, Year, and Item Location Status. Under the Year column in the Criteria row, I'm going to enter less than 2000 and press Enter. 
Notice how Access places 2000 in quotation marks and excludes the less than symbol. Access assumes correctly that the less than symbol is not part of the phrase that I'm searching on, but is rather a Boolean operator telling the program to display only items prior to or less than 2000. In the item location status column in the criteria row, I will enter not withdrawn and press enter. Access assumes correctly that not is functioning as a Boolean operator. It will be displaying all results whose item and location status does not match withdrawn. Next, I'll run the query. I'm seeing some fairly ancient titles listed in this table. Some good candidates for weeding from the collection. I'll save the query and assign it a descriptive file name. Then I'll close the table. Notice that the two queries I just created now display in the Objects pane on the left side of the screen. If you need to revisit a query to review or modify it, simply double click on the file name to open it. Let's now look at the Reports feature in Access. Reports allow you to print assembled data in a custom layout. You can create reports based on tables and or queries. I'll create a report based on the last query. I just need to make sure that the Create tab is selected and it is. There are actually several methods for creating a report as you can see in the Report group. It's recommended that you use the report wizard. It's the most straightforward method for putting a report together. The design method works best for tables and queries because of their more complex structure, but the wizard will suit most purposes well. I'll click on the report wizard icon to launch the wizard. Access asks which table or query I'm basing my report on. I'll click on the down arrow beneath the Table Queries heading and select Query Titles for Withdrawal. Note, you can select more than one table or query. You would simply repeat this step to add any additional tables and queries. All the fields from my selected query appear on the left in the Available Fields window. You use the right arrow that you see in the middle to move selected fields to the selected fields window one at a time. However, if you want to include all fields in your report, you don't need to click one by one on each. Simply click on the double right facing arrow to move all available fields into the selected fields window at once. I'll want all fields to appear in my report, so I'll do that. And I'll click Next. Access asks me here if I want to set up grouping levels. Grouping levels allow you to group your report listing by categories or a single category. In a larger report, you might consider grouping listings by item type, perhaps. All audio CDs would be listed together, followed by all DVDs, and so on. But I don't need to set up grouping levels for such a small report. So, I'll just click on the left arrow to deselect the grouping level that Access has proposed. Then I'll click Next. You can select a sort order for up to four fields. I'll click on the down arrow to select the title field. I'll keep it in ascending order, which is the default, and then I'll click Next. I'm asked to choose a layout type. In this case, I'll stick to columnar, although tabular is also a popular option. I prefer columnar particularly for reports that contain many fields. 
tabular formats lay out the fields side by side, and it can be sometimes challenging to fit all fields on the page. I'll set the page orientation to portrait, and then I'll click Next. At the prompt to enter a title for the report, I'll stick with the default assigned by Access. Then I'll make sure Preview the report is selected, and I'll click Finish. The report appears in Print Preview. Note that any changes to data in the source tables or queries will be automatically updated in your report. I'm going to close Print Preview, and it lands me in a very scary looking design view. This is not a view you should have to work with. I'm going to change the view to Layout, and I'll go over here to do that. I'll click on the down arrow under View, and I'll select Layout View. I'll save the report and close it. And if you go to the Objects pane and select All Access Objects, you'll see the report listed. I haven't created a form yet, but we'll do that in the next exercise, which will involve creating a simple database from scratch. I'm going to close out the Heart Sounds database by going to File and choosing Close Database. In this section of the tutorial, I'm going to create a simple database from scratch. Access offers a variety of templates to help you put together specific kinds of databases. While you may explore those on your own, today I'm going to stick with a blank database. You'll notice that that is currently selected. On the right-hand side of the screen, I'm asked to assign a file name for the database. So I'll do that. I'll highlight the default and overwrite it with my own. Next, I'm asked to choose a location to save the file. I'm going to choose the desktop and click OK, and then I'll click Create. What I'm going to create now is a simple inventory database. With the knowledge you've gained from examining a pre-existing database, you will hopefully be able to understand the process of creating this very basic practice database. It will have three tables, the main inventory table and two source or parent tables, manufacturers and suppliers. What you see initially is a blank table with the working title of Table 1 waiting to be populated with data. I could enter the field names and data directly here in Datasheet View without setting foot into Design View but it's better to establish the field names, the primary key, and any table relationships first. So I'll start off in Design View. As I click on the Design View icon, I'm prompted to save the table. This first table I'll call Manufacturers. Always create your source tables first, and then the central table so that when you're ready to link the feeder tables, they have already been constructed. Access has already proposed a first field name, ID, and has assigned it an auto number data type. Do you remember that sometimes you need to have an auto numbered ID field as your primary key? It's possible on occasion that the field you'd want to select for your primary key cannot guarantee uniqueness among its entries. In an employee database, last name would not make a wise choice for the primary key, would it? There will likely be multiple instances of employees with shared last names. For the table I'm about to create, it's a good bet that the manufacturer names will not be duplicated. So I'll type over ID, entering Manufacturer instead. 
Then I'll tab over to the data type window and change auto number to text. Do you notice that Access has chosen this field to be its primary key? The little key icon appears next to the word manufacturer. This is the field I'd like for my primary key, so I won't need to change it. I'm going to press tab or you can press enter until I arrive back at the field name column. The second field name will be website. Then I'll tab over to the data field where I'll accept text as my entry. That's correct. And then I'll tab again till I'm back at the field name column. And the third field name will be phone number. I'm going to enter it as one compound word without a space between the two words. You learned earlier in the tutorial that in large databases, eliminating spaces between words and field names speeds up data processing. Although this is going to be a tiny database, I'll adopt the practice here. Remember that I can spell phone number as two separate words down in the caption section of field properties. I'm going to tab over to data type and I'll accept text, which is what they give. Even though phone numbers are made up of numbers, they are not used in calculations. They behave more like text, and that is why I chose text rather than number for my data type. I'll go now into caption, and I'll spell out phone number as two words, and that's how it will appear in the table that people see. Next, I'll move up one row to Input Mask. I have a phone number, and I want to make sure that anyone entering phone numbers does so in a consistent way. I'd like to choose parentheses around the area code and then a dash following the next three numbers. So, as I've clicked on Input Mask, I see a Build button appears on the right. I'll click once on that. The Input Mask Wizard has launched and phone number is the first category listed. As it is highlighted, I'll just go ahead and click Next. I'll stick with Access's proposed input format, which is what I want, parentheses and then a dash, and I'll click Next. I'll choose to store the data without the symbols in the mask, just speeds up data processing, and I'll click Next and then I'll click Finish. I'll now return to Datasheet View, and I'm prompted to save the table first, so I'm going to click Yes to do that. In Datasheet View, the field names appear across the top of the table, and the cursor is in the first cell where I will enter data. So I'll enter it now. I'll tab over to Website and enter that information. And I'll enter a phone number. And I don't need to add parentheses or dashes. They'll be supplied automatically. And I'll tab down to the next line and continue to enter my information. Skipping ahead a bit, I've just entered my last bit of text for this table. You'll likely remember that data entered on the data sheet is saved automatically without prompting. I'll go ahead and close the table out, and then I'll go back to the Objects pane and double click to reopen it. And you'll notice the text is still there. But if I need to alter the physical layout of the table in any way, I will be prompted to save. And that's what I'm going to do next. I need to adjust the column width of the website column so that all the text displays in it. As you may recall, you can either click in the border between the column and the one to the right of it and then drag the mouse pointer to stretch out the column, or you can double click on that border to resize it. I'll go ahead, position my mouse till it's a double sided arrow, and double click to resize it automatically. I'll do the same thing for the phone number column. If I try to close the table now, 
After I've altered the physical layout of the table, I'm going to be prompted to save it. So I'll say yes, and it's closed. I'm ready now to create my second table, which will be the suppliers table. To start a new table, I'll click on the Create tab and choose Table Design. I'm immediately taken to Design View in this brand new table. Access has not entered a default primary key in this table. It's completely blank. I'll go ahead and enter my field names along with their associated data types. And I need to assign a primary key for this table. So my first, the supplier field, will be my primary key. I'll enter that. Enter its data type, text, and since this row is already selected, I'll click on primary key. Then I'll tab to finish creating my field names. Skipping ahead a bit, I've entered all my field names and their data types. As with the previous tables, all the fields are text fields. You'll notice down below in field properties for the phone number row that I have applied an input mask so as to restrict how phone numbers are entered. And since I wrote phone number as a compound word up in the field name column, I added a caption where it's spelled out as two words. And now I'll return to the data sheet view. I was already prompted to save and did so. Back in data sheet view, I'll enter my data for this table, pressing enter or the tab key to move from column to column and then to the next row. Skipping ahead, I've entered all my data and now I'll double click between border headings auto stretch my column so the text isn't truncated anymore and then I'll press save and I'll close out the table. The last table of this database will be my inventory table. This is going to be the central table and will be drawing information from the two tables I just created. I'll make sure the create tab is selected and then I'll click on table design. I'm taken right away to design view. The categories for this table are going to be item description, manufacturer, supplier, unit, and unit price. I could assign item description as the primary key, chalk, erasers, and so on. But it's possible that I'll have duplications in my entries. I may buy, for instance, chalk from Office Max one week and another week see chalk on sale at Office Depot. So I would need separate listings for chalk for the one I buy from Office Max and then the one I buy from Office Depot. Looks like I'll need an item ID field. So the first field name will be item ID, which is an auto number type. So I'll click on the down arrow and select auto number. And since I've typed item ID as a compound word, I'm going to go to caption and spell it out as two words. My next field name will be manufacturer. So I'll enter that in the field name column. And I'll tab over to data type. Now this is a text field, but I'm not going to use text as my data type. Remember, I've created a manufacturer table and I want to establish a link between this table and that source table. So I'm going to click on the down arrow and launch the lookup wizard, which will help me to connect the two tables. This is our first look inside the lookup wizard. Access assumes I want to look up the values from an existing table, which is what I want to do. So I'll leave that option selected and click next. I'm asked which table I want to link to. I'll select manufacturers and it's actually already selected so I'll click next. Then I'm asked which field or fields I'd like to appear in the lookup table. When I'm in the inventory table and get to the manufacturers column what happens is that I see a down arrow that when I click on it 
displays a list of all the manufacturers I've entered in the source table. I then simply click on the correct one and it appears in my cell. It saves me the trouble of having to type out the manufacturer name each and every time I pass through that column. Now, Access is asking me here how many fields I want it to display when I click on that down arrow. I really only need to display as many fields from the source table as are necessary for me to identify the manufacturer I'm looking for. In the case of the manufacturer table, the name is really the only field I need. There are no two manufacturers with the same name, so just displaying the manufacturer field is all we need to do. The manufacturer field is already selected, so I'll click on this single right arrow to move it into the selected fields window, and I'm ready to click next. But first, when would you need to display more than one field in a lookup table? Well, if your primary key in a source table is an auto number, for instance, just displaying a field of numbers won't help you to pick out which record any given number represents. In a case like that, you would want to display more descriptive fields than the auto number field. So I would select as many fields to display side by side in the lookup window as it takes for me to be able to identify correctly which record I'm pulling up. Again, manufacture is all we need for this, so I'll click Next. And then I have the opportunity to sort the records in ascending or descending order. And I'll click on the down arrow and select Manufacturer, and the default is ascending, which I want. So I'll click Next, and it shows me what an alphabetical listing of my manufacturers will look like. I'll click Next. I'll leave the title as Manufacturer and I'll select Enable Data Integrity. This ensures that I can only add new manufacturers to the Manufacturer table, my source table, and never to the Inventory table. Access will reject any attempt I make to do that. Access then asks me to choose between Cascade Delete and Restrict Delete. I will want to go with Restrict Delete. A cascade deletion means that if I delete a manufacturer who goes out of business, any record in my database that is connected to that company is deleted as well. That's certainly not what I want to have happen. Once I click Finish, I see a message that I must save the table before relationships can be created. So I'll do that. I'll click Yes. and it's telling me there's no primary key supplied. It's offering to make one for me, and I'm going to say no. I'll assign it myself, so I'll click no. I'll click in the item ID field, which is what I want to use for my primary key, and I'll click on the primary key icon. Notice that next to manufacturer, the data type says text, but in fact, we did use the lookup wizard to establish the link with the manufacturer table. Next, I'll enter supplier in the field name column and tab over to data type. And again, I'm going to use the lookup wizard to set up a relationship between this table and the supplier table. So I want the lookup field to get the values from another table or query. I'll click Next and which table or query should provide the values. Well, that would be the supplier table, so I'll select that and click Next. And what fields do I want displaying so that I can identify the suppliers? Well, I only need the supplier field, so I'll click that over into Selected Fields and click Next. And I would like it to appear in ascending order. I get a preview of that in this window. I click Next, and then I want to enable da data integrity, and I want to select Restrict Delete. I'll click Finish, and the table must be saved again before relationships can be created, so I'll click Yes. My next field to enter is Unit, and that is a data type. 
I'll tab to field name column and enter unit price as one word. And the data type for that is not text, it's actually currency. So I'll select that. Down in the caption window, I will enter unit price as two separate words. What if I suddenly realize that there is a field name that I meant to enter earlier on and forgot to? Well, I can insert it anywhere I need to. I'd like to insert it, its item description, right after the item ID field name. So I'll position my mouse in the gray cell next to manufacturer, and I'll right mouse click, and I'll choose insert rows. And then I'll click inside here and enter item description. That is a text type, and down in the caption area, I will type it as two words. I'll go ahead and press save. Everything's entered, and I'm going to click on datasheet view. The cursor in the datasheet is positioned in the item ID column, and you see the word new. Access automatically numbers auto number columns, so you won't need to type anything in there. I'll press either enter or tab to move to the next column and start typing the information. As I do this, a 1 appears in the item ID column next to my entry. This number will stay attached to this particular record, even if I end up deleting it. To reassign numbers would upset the integrity of the database. I'll tab over to the Manufacturer column, where you'll see a down arrow appear. Clicking on this, I can search from the contents that I entered in the Manufacturer table. And I'll select my Manufacturer for this item. I'll tab over to Supplier. Here, I'll look up the information I added to the Supplier table. I'll tab over to Unit and enter the Unit Type. And I'll tab over to Unit Price. Here, I do not need to add dollar signs, but I will need to add a decimal point to make that 79 cents. I'll press Tab to bypass the Item ID column, which is self-filling, and enter my next item. I'll tab over to the Manufacturer, and this time I'm going to use Autocomplete. If I start to type in something listed in the Manufacturer field, Access will recognize it and autocomplete it. I'll use Autocomplete in the Supplier column as well. Office Depot is what I want, and that's what it's selected. And then I'll enter my unit and my price. I don't need to add a dollar sign again, just the decimal point. And I'll press Tab or Enter until I'm back at item description. I'm going to fill out the rest of this table, but I'm going to create a form to finish my data entry in. So I'm going to close out of the table. Then I'll make sure Create is selected, and I'm going to choose Form Wizard. As you can see, there are many ways of creating a form as listed on the ribbon, including form design. Forms, like reports, are very straightforward entities in a database that do not require much under the hood work. So you're safe to rely on the wizard for creating all your forms. Inside the form wizard, I'm asked to select which table I'm basing my form on, and I'll select inventory. Next, I'm asked which fields in this table I want to appear on the form. Normally, I'd select all fields, and that would mean clicking on the double right-facing arrows. But as I can't enter anything in the item ID field, since it's an auto number type, I will deselect item ID. I'll click on it, and I'll click on the single left arrow to remove it from the selected fields pane. Then I'm ready to click Next, and it asks me what I would like for my layout, and I'll accept the default, which is columnar. 
and click Next. And for the title, I'll use the same title as for my table. And I'll have open the form to view or enter information selected, and I'll click Finish. Forms allow for easier data entry and editing than tables do because they permit you to edit and add data in a format that displays fields for just one record at a time. Any information typed in a form is automatically added and saved to the source table. So as I fill in my data in the inventory form, the same data is populating the inventory table as well simultaneously. If you like the form format and you'd rather enter all your data in a form than type it directly in the source table, feel free. Simply set up your field names, data types, and field properties in the table's design view, then save and close the table, and then create your form. As information is entered into the form, it is added automatically to the source table. You can see the table data created earlier appearing in the form. And I'll use these navigation tools here on the bottom to scroll from record to record. There's my second record, and you see I have two of two. If I want to create a brand new record, I can click here, or I can click on the new blank record option. And I get a blank record. I'll go ahead and add my next item. And I'll press tab to move from field to field. As with the table, I can click on a down arrow and select my manufacturer from the source table and I'll do the same with supplier. I'll enter my unit and I'll tab to unit price. And I press enter and it took me to the next screen, but let me go back so you can see what I've entered here. I'll continue to press New Record and add entries to my inventory list until my form has been completed. Skipping ahead, I have completed data entry for all the items in my inventory. I've just entered my unit price and I'm going to press Enter to accept it. I'm now taken to a blank record. Just ignore it. At this point, we can close the form and all data is saved automatically. And to make sure, I'll double click on the inventory form to reopen it. And you'll see that I have five entries in this form. So I'll close it again and I'll open up the inventory table by double clicking on it and I have entries that didn't appear initially in my table. I had only added two entries before I went to the form, but you can see that all of my form entries have been added automatically into my table. I'll need to expand my item description column, so I'll position my mouse pointer between these two headings till it changes to a double-sided arrow, and then I'll double-click to expand it. I'm going to do the same thing for manufacturer. Double click to expand it so that you can see the full heading. Now you may have noticed that there's a gap in the numbering here. That occurred because when I was in forms, I inserted an accidental entry between the first and second entries and I needed to delete it. Therefore, along with the entry went its associated item ID number. Since I've changed the physical layout of this table, I'll press Save, and then I'll press Close. Before we dive into querying, I'd like to open up the Relationships window and make sure that everything's set up properly. So I'm going to make sure Database Tools is selected, and then I'm going to click on Relationships. Do you remember in the previous exercise, the one and the infinity symbol? This appears on both join lines, indicating a one-to-many relationship between tables. I'm going to double click on one of the join lines, and you can see that we have enforced referential integrity. In fact, we did that 
when we used the lookup wizard. We also had the option to select cascade delete related records, but we did not do that. One thing we did not do in the lookup wizard is to set up cascade update related fields, and I'd like to do that here. When this option is selected, it enables you to edit a field entry anywhere in your database, and Access will apply that change to every instance of that entry throughout the entire database. If 3M one day becomes 4M, I would only need to make that edit in the manufacturer table, and then any other tables, queries, forms, reports that mention 3M would automatically change it to 4M as well. So it's important that I enable this option. And I'm going to do this for this as well. And now I'll click on the close button. If you look on the objects pane, you should see three tables and one form that have been created. Now it's time to query. For my query, I'd like to list out the items in my inventory that cost $5 or more. I'm going to click on the Create tab, and then I'm going to go to the Queries group, and I'm going to select Query Design. The Show Table window appears, and I'll select the Inventory table. It's actually already highlighted, so I'll click Add. And that's all I need for this query. I'll click Close now. Next, I'll stretch out the inventory so I can see all the fields by clicking and dragging the border. For my query, I'm going to use the following fields. Item description, so I'll double click that. Manufacturer, supplier, and unit price. Notice they all appear side by side down below. The query is based on cost, so the unit price column is where I'll set my criterion. I want to display only items costing $5 or more, so to do that I'll need to create an expression that means greater than or equal to. Let me click here in the criteria row and type the greater than symbol followed by equal followed by the number 5. Notice I did not enter the dollar sign. In fact, doing so would throw off my results. Access knows that this is a currency-based field and recognizes the 5, therefore, as currency and not text. I'm going to press the Run button to see my results. Spot on. Let's go back to Design View and see what happens if I enter my criteria as $5 and run the query. So instead of 5, I'm going to enter dollar sign 5. Notice I get an error message. Access has treated dollar sign 5 as literal text. Notice the quotation marks around it. I'll need to delete that and simply re-enter it as 5. So I'll click OK and get rid of the quotes and the dollar sign. And if I run it one more time, I get my query results. I'll press save and name my query. I'll call it cost query. And then I'll exit the query. Notice that it appears in the objects pane on the left side of the screen. Next, I'll create a report based on my just completed query. To access reports, I make sure that the Create tab is selected, and I go over to the Reports group, and I choose Report Wizard. From the Tables and Queries menu, I'm going to pick Query Cost Query as my source. The wizard asks which fields from the query I want to include in the report. I'll include all of them. So the easiest way to do that is to click on the double right facing arrow to move them all into selected fields. Then I'll click Next. 
I'm asked if I want to set any grouping levels. I'm going to say no, so I'm going to click on the left arrow to put manufacturer back on the left side. I'm going to click next, and then I'm going to choose a sort order, alphabetical by item description. I'll click next and then select a columnar layout. That's my personal preference. And I'll click next and then accept the default title given by access to my report. And I notice that preview the report is selected. That's what I want. So then I'll click finish. My report appears in print preview. I'll click on the red button with the X to close it, and then I end up in Design View. I don't really want to be there, it's rather an intimidating screen to look at, so I'm going to go over to here and click on the down arrow under View and choose Layout View. I'd like to change the formatting of this report. To do that, under Report Layout Tools, I'm going to go to the Themes group and click on the down arrow underneath Themes. And then I can glide my mouse over different formatting types, realizing that the gallery is obscuring my report a bit. I'm going to click on this one called Austin. And now I notice that some of my text appears truncated because this is a larger font. So it's easy to stretch and shrink text boxes in your report. Uh, for this, I'm going to click over top of cost QUE and I'm going to position my mouse on the right border till it becomes a double sided arrow. I'll click and drag to the right and now I can see all of my text. And you can do this if you find that other elements of your report become cut off. You can stretch and shrink as you need to. I'm going to go ahead and press save. I'm then going to close out the report. I've completed this access database, so I'm going to close it by going to file and selecting close database. Now before we end, I want to show you something I get asked about quite often, and that is how to import an Excel spreadsheet into Access. This process works very well with simple spreadsheets. Should yours be fairly complex, the process may involve a good amount of cleanup in Access. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate the process with a very basic spreadsheet. First, I'll need to create a new blank database. So I'm going to go to Blank Database, and I'm going to give it a file name. And I'll select the desktop to save it to, click OK, and then I'll select Create. Next, I'm going to click on the External Data tab and select from the Import and Link group Excel. This launches the import wizard. I'll find the file on my computer by clicking on Browse. And here's my Excel file, so I'll click on that and click Open. Next, I'm asked to specify how and where I want to store the data in the current database and I do want to select the default, import the source data into a new table in the current database. I'll click OK. Data from the worksheet is partially displayed below. Don't be concerned by its appearance in this window. It won't look quite like this in Access. I'll click Next. I'm next asked if the first row contains headings. It does, so I'll click on that first row contains column headings. After clicking Next again, I'm asked if I'd like to edit the information about my fields. 
As I click on each heading, I'm given the option to rename it. I won't actually be doing that. I'll just click Next instead. Microsoft then asks if I would like to have the program assign a primary key. I don't want to because my GWID field contains all unique identifiers. I want that to be my primary key. So I'll select Choose My Own, and then from the drop-down list, select GWID. I'll click Next, and then I'll click Finish. I'm asked if I want to save these import steps. I'm going to say no for now and press close. And we see the table listed in the objects pane. I'm going to open it to see how well it translated. The database looks good. So I'll press file and save. And then I'll exit access. Thank you for watching these tutorials. If you have any questions or would like to set up a consultation, please contact me at Himmelfarb Library. My name is Katherine Sluter, and my email address is crharris at gwu.edu. Good luck.